Hey everybody, this is Russ from Metro Game Core. It's been a while since I've done a video about the Super Console X devices. Now, I reviewed just about all of them at some point last year, but over time, I just kind of decided to stop reviewing those devices. When it came down to it, they were all using very similar chips and the performance was just kind of the same all around. Not only that, I found that the SD card images they were using were just not very well done. Now, I recently saw one on AliExpress that was kind of different, and so I decided to buy it. And so that's what we're gonna review here today. This is called the Super Console Arcade, and it's made by the same people who make all the other Super Console X devices. Now this has actually been out for a few months now, but I finally got around to actually reviewing it. You can currently find it on Amazon for about $120 with a $15 off coupon, but bear in mind this is not Amazon Prime, so they're going to charge you $7 for delivery, and it's probably going to take about three weeks to get there. And this $115-ish dollar price right here is the version without any games at all. But if you want, you can spend more and get it preloaded with some SD cards as well. Well, personally, I grabbed the 128 gig card, so that's what we're going to review today. Now, if you want to save a little bit more money, you can actually just get these on AliExpress. As you can see here, it's about $100 for the one without any games, and you have the option of getting a black model as well. Also, bear in mind, depending on where you live, they might charge you shipping too. And finally, same thing here, you can buy them loaded up with SD cards as well. And I'll have links to all this stuff in the video description in case you're interested. But in today's video, my plan here is to just do a deep dive on this arcade stick. And surprisingly, there's a lot to this, way more than the other Super Console X devices. Because in addition to being a standalone console, meaning that you can just plug this into your TV and start playing games, it also functions as a fully working arcade stick as well. And so not only will it function as kind of a homemade arcade console with a stick already built in, but you could use this stick to play your favorite PS4, Nintendo Switch, or even PC games. Now in the box, it does come with some instructions, but I gotta say outright, you know, these instructions are not very clearly written. But luckily I'll walk you through most of the functions here in this video. And so this is what it looks like here. It's very reminiscent of the 8-bit Doe arcade stick, which I feel was first inspired by the NES Advanced stick back in the day. Now in addition to having your traditional Xbox button layout, it also has PlayStation labels as well. And the components on this are pretty nice, you know, the buttons feel good and the stick is also nice and responsive. We'll get into more detail with that here in a bit. But as it stands right now, I have no complaints about the controls, they feel really solid. And like I mentioned, I got the 128 gig model as you see here. So here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna first boot this up like its own console. We're gonna kind of review that for a bit and then we'll kind of pick it apart a little bit more once I get back to my desk. Now, when you first boot this up, you're probably gonna discover a couple things. Number one is that this is basically just an Android TV box that has a controller wrapped around it. And as you may know, these TV boxes are compatible with a firmware called Emulec. Now, Emulec is an open source Linux based distribution, but this is where it gets shady. Ken Hank will basically take that image, put a bunch of games on it, and then sell it. This is not supposed to be something they're doing. And as you'll see as we go through this video here, they don't do a very good job with this game image either. For example, you can see here it has 20,000 games on it. That seems really impressive for a 128 gig card. And so you might be thinking, wow, this has got everything I could ever want to play. But you probably are going to want to dig a little bit further and actually get to the truth. For example, on Final Burn Neo, which is an arcade ROM set, there are almost 7,000 of those 20,000 games. And as you scroll down the games list, you'll find that there are duplicates left and right. And so yes, it looks like there are 6,000 games on here, but my guess here is there's probably less than 1,000. And even then, some of those thousand are going to be junk games you're not going to want to play anyway. Now, to give you an example, we're going to try out 1944, The Loop Master. Now, I tried the American version first, and it crashed. And then I tried the European one, and that also crashed. And this is kind of par for the course with a lot of these arcade titles. Really, only one of these is probably going to work, and you're going to have to go through and figure out which one does. But once you have it loaded, you are going to see a couple things right off the bat. Number one, you will probably see bezels on the left to the right of the screen. This is to cover up the black bars from playing 4x3 content on a 16x9 TV. Another thing that I notice is the image quality is very soft, so my guess here is they have bilinear filtering on by default. And so back in the games menu here, I just press start to go into the game settings and then I adjust it to my own preferences. For example, I like to keep the aspect ratio at core provided, and then I turn off the smooth games function, which is the bilinear filter. There are some things I do want to turn on, like auto save and auto load, but for a TV setup like this, I will usually turn off integer scaling so that way it fills up the whole TV. And 
really that's about it. One thing to also note is that they're using an old version of Emulec. This is 3.9 and they're much higher than that. I think they're on like 4.3 at this point. But as you can see here, this is my preferred way of playing. By changing out some of those options, I now have removed those bezels so I can see a little bit more of the screen. And by turning off the bilinear filter, it's a much sharper display. And so yeah, I think when it comes to arcade gaming, this is not bad once you make those little tweaks. And there are some things they did get right. For example, they added the samples to some of these main games. So King Kong actually has the audio samples, which often doesn't happen when you load up your own ROM set. And so if you're looking for an arcade stick that is preloaded with games, yes, this is preloaded with games. But just as a word of caution here, you're going to spend a lot of time going through these menus trying to find the game that actually runs. My number one recommendation here is actually going to be to not buy a system that has a card on it. Number one, you're going to save a good amount of money, but you're also going to save yourself the headache of trying to navigate through those menus. And so my plan here is that I'm actually going to make a follow-on video to this one where I actually show you how to set this up properly. What we'll do is we'll download the open source firmware, we'll flash it onto a good SD card, and then we'll load it up with our own ROMs and also make it all work perfectly. So be on the lookout for that video in the coming weeks, but that's my plan going forward. Now, if you do plan on getting one that is preloaded, my recommendation would be to go through those menus and delete out the games that don't play. Another thing you could do is you could go through and press the X button when you're on a game that you like, and then it'll move to the favorites. And by adding a game to your favorites list, it'll show up at the top of the menu and it'll make it a lot easier to navigate. Either way, from a performance standpoint, this is going to be great for arcade titles. This can basically play all the way up to Killer Instinct. Killer Instinct itself is not going to play well, but everything else leading up to it will. So I like to think of it like it'll play all the Street Fighter games and all the Mortal Kombat games, but not quite Killer Instinct. Now, when it comes to those Capcom-based arcade games, you know, the ones that have the six-button layout, you will have to go into the settings and make some adjustments. And that's because the Fierce Kick and Fierce Punch buttons are not assigned as you would think in the arcade layout. So I'm going to make it easy on you. Get into the quick menu of RetroArch by pressing Select and Y, and then go into Controls. Within the Port 1 controls, you want to change the Strong Punch and the Strong Kick to the layout that you see here. After you've done that, you want to back out to that main controls menu and then Save Game Remap File. That means every time you start up that particular game, it's going to work properly. And then from that point forward, what you can do is you can open up any other Capcom fighting game, go into the Controls section, and then load that game remap file for Street Fighter 2. That's going to apply that remap to whatever game you're using and then all you have to do from there is just save game remap file again. It'll make a new remap for that specific game. And so as you can see here I'm playing Street Fighter 3 Third Strike, one of the hardest Street Fighter games to play. It's playing just fine. And I didn't have to remap the controls here. All I did is I loaded up the other remap file and then saved it. So that's the workaround to get these games to work properly. But yeah, across the board, if you're a big fan of 80s and 90s arcade games like me, you're probably going to love this stick. This thing controls really well and it plays all these games perfectly. Now, in addition to the Final Burn Neo and MAME lists, which are pretty comprehensive, you also have a comprehensive Neo Geo list as well. And this one's a little bit better curated, it doesn't have a bunch of duplicates in it. Now, one thing I would recommend doing, if you don't like having that slowdown in Neo Geo games, one thing you can do is you can go into the game options and then in Increase the CPU clock speed to 150%. From there, you can select the Create Game Options file. It'll save it only for that specific game, like Metal Slug X, as you see here. And now the game's going to play at full speed without slowdown. Of course, if you want that true arcade experience, you can just leave it as is and you will get that slowdown. Either way, as I said, yes, this is going to be great for arcade titles all the way up through Killer Instinct. Now, me personally, this is like the golden era of arcade gaming, so I'm super happy with that. Now, this thing is not just loaded up with arcade games, it has console games too, but be careful what you wish for. For example, with Sega Genesis and Super Nintendo, it is just filled with a bunch of homebrews and hacks and things like that. For example, you'll have to flip through hundreds of different Sonic games to find the originals. But you might actually find that to be pretty cool. For example, my six-year-old son, he was super excited to play Christmas Sonic the Hedgehog 2. Me, personally, I thought it was super dumb, but, you know, your mileage may vary. Either way, this is going to be another place where you're going to want to have to save your favorites so that you can find them easily or delete the ones you don't want. But I gotta be honest here, if you're looking for an easy and quick fix here, I still don't think buying a preloaded card is a good decision. I honestly think you're probably going to spend more time deleting out the games you don't want to play or curating a favorites list than you would if you just built your own ROM library, and I think you would learn a lot along the way as well. So just to reiterate here, my recommendation is to save your money and not buy the one that has the card already in it, and instead make your own SD card image file based on the video that I'll have posted here shortly. Okay, so yes, this can play classic 16-bit, 32-bit 
bit, absolutely no problem. This is actually a little bit more powerful than an RK3326 chip, so anything you can expect from those retro handhelds, you can expect here. So let's take a minute and push it to its limits to see what it can and cannot do. First thing, for Nintendo 64, this one is all messed up in its configuration. What you'll want to do is go into these controls here as well. And what's going on here is they've assigned the D-pad to be the left analog stick. And so what you'll have to do here is you'll have to assign the D-pad controls to the analog stick. After that, I would save the core remap file as well as the content directory remap file. That means no matter what you use in terms of cores or whatever for Nintendo 64, it's going to control properly. Anyway, after that, it is going to work, but I did reduce the resolution from 480p to 240p. I would say that's going to make maybe three quarters of the Nintendo 64 catalog run at full speed. But as you can see, the pixels are very chunky and you may not like this lower fidelity. So what I would recommend here is to use the shader. You can actually do this in the emulation station menu, but I'm just going to run it right now. And this one here is the scanline shader. I know it doesn't look very good here on this screen, but in real life, this works wonders at a 240p display. It's going to basically mimic a CRT feel, and with that lower resolution, it actually looks really good and nice and nostalgic. So for Nintendo 64, that's my recommendation. Go into the game options files, change it to a 240p resolution, and then assign a scanline shader to make it all kind of balanced and look nice. Of course, you're going to be limited in Nintendo 64 games that are going to work well with an arcade stick anyway, so it's probably mostly going to be racing games and things like that. But it can play all the way up to F-Zero X, no problem. But games like Cruisin' USA, they're not going to work at all. Same thing with like 007 or Conker's Bad Fur Day. Now for some of those other higher end systems, let's try a couple of those Dreamcast based arcade systems. We'll start with Sega Naomi. And so I think when it comes to most of these games, they're going to play okay. But if you look at the frames for a second here at the top right, you can see that it is not getting a full 60. Instead, what it's doing here with the Flycast cores, it's doing an auto frame skip. So it is keeping it at a pretty fast speed, but you are going to lose some frames per second in the process. And so if you're looking for that pixel perfect arcade gameplay with Dreamcast based systems, I don't think the Super Console arcade stick is going to be the right choice. At this point, you're probably going to be best served by maybe making a mini PC with Botocera firmware and then adding an arcade stick of your own. But of course, the price difference between the two, you know, this is about a $100 setup versus something that would be about three or $400. It's a big gap. So I think across the board for $100 to $120, this is actually a really great deal. Okay, let's take a look at a couple other systems. Now, under the PSP menu, it looks really impressive. There's a bunch of games. But as you start going through, you realize that they just loaded up with all the PSP mini games. These are basically like old cell phone games from back in the day. They're really not worth playing. And so if you're hoping to play like God of War or something like that, no way, it's not going to be possible on this device. But the games you see here will probably run fine. Now, another thing that surprised me is that there are hundreds of PS1 games on here. Remember, I only have a 128 gig card. And because most of these games are between 500 megs and a gig, it was really surprising to see such a large list. But as I booted it up, I figured out the con here. So you may not know this, but floating around on the internet, there are really compressed version of PS1 games out there. What they do is they strip out all of the CD music and only put the game assets inside. What this means, you can take a PS1 game from about 500 megabytes down to about 10. And so that's what they've done here. Yes, there are a bunch of PS1 games and they are going to play pretty well, but they will have no music in the background and a lot of the sounds that you're expecting just won't be there. So it's really going to be up to you whether or not you find that to be playable. Personally, I totally don't think it is. But it is kind of a neat novelty to play your favorite game without any background music. It's really kind of jarring for certain games. Anyway, that's why there are so many PS1 games on this list with a card that only has 128 gigs of storage. Okay, so that's a look at the Super Console Arcade experience just as a console. Now let's take a deeper dive into the stick itself. First, let's talk about the design. Now, I already mentioned that it has both Xbox and PlayStation control layouts. I actually really prefer this. This is handy. Now, this is laid out exactly like the 8-Bit Do Pro stick. So it has the bumpers up top and the triggers on the bottom. Now, if you are going to use this as an arcade stick, there are some different modes that you can apply in order to get them to work on various systems. And I'll show you how to get that set up here in a minute. There's also a D-pad button here, which can change the analog stick from being an analog stick to a D-pad input. Now there's a home button, which will work as the PlayStation or the home button, depending on what system you're using. And you can also set it up for turbo button controls. And your select and start buttons are here on the top as well. To get out of a game in the arcade, you would hold down select and press start twice. Now let's talk a little bit about these buttons. Now these are kind of unique. They have a little bit more travel than you would be expecting from a lot of like fight sticks or other arcade sticks. 
In fact, it kind of feels a bit like a mixture between a fighting stick and some of those old school 80s arcade buttons. It requires a lot more force to push down on than you might be expecting, but I actually think that's a really good thing. Now this arcade stick is actually pretty good. To give it the best praise I can, I have no intentions of replacing this at all. I think it's nice and punchy, and it feels very high quality too, especially at this price point. Now one thing I did observe is that the arcade stick is pretty darn thick. And initially I thought I wasn't going to like how big it is, but it actually turns out to be very comfortable to hold because it's rounded on the edges. Not much on the bottom other than these four big rubber feet which also contain screws underneath. And so now let's take a look at the I.O. on the back of the device itself. We have our headphone jack, an SD card slot where you'll put your firmware and games, a USB-A port for an external controller, then of course HDMI for video output, and it also has an Ethernet connection. Finally, you have a barrel plug for the power and then a power button to power it on. On the far side here is a Type-C connector. This is for when you're going to be using this as an external arcade stick. So this part has nothing to do with the Super Console X part of it, but more as just using it as a controller. So I was really curious to how they kind of pulled all this off, and so I decided to tear down the machine and have a look inside. Unfortunately, you do have to pull off these rubber feet and they don't come off very easily, and so I wouldn't recommend doing this very often if you do need to get inside. Okay, let's take a look at the bottom first. Now this little green PCB right here is actually the controller board for when you're going to be using it as an external arcade stick. This is the USB-C input that we saw earlier. Now on the bottom here we also have this big sheet of metal. Now this is just a weight to give it more balance and heft. And I think it does the job, it keeps it really sturdy. And finally, this blackboard that we're seeing right here, this is the Android TV box. And as you can see, it's about the same size as all those Super Console X devices. So I'm gonna pull off this heatsink and have a look at the CPU, because I'm actually not sure what it's running. Now the first thing I noticed is my alcohol wipes had a really hard time getting this thermal paste off. So what I had to do is use a guitar pick to kind of scrape it clean. And I took a sample here, and yeah, this is actually silicon-based thermal paste. This stuff is like super cheap, but not very conductive at all. And so that's why it was so hard to get off. They went with the really cheap stuff. Now let's take a look at the chip. So this is an S905L chip. Now this is basically the same as an S905X chip, but I think it's been clocked a little bit higher of a clock speed. And also it has some functions removed from it that we aren't actually gonna need anyway. Now I have a little bit larger of a heatsink, so I'm gonna use this one instead. Now these things are made out of aluminum and they really don't do a very good job anyway. But while I'm here, I figured that I would add some thermal tape like you can see here. And so I'm gonna add it to the CPU and then I'm also gonna add it to the RAM chips as well. And so the idea here is that I'm gonna cover up some of those heat producing aspects of this PCB and maybe we'll get a little bit more performance, but honestly, I'm not really betting on it. So I don't think that's a necessary thing, but if you have those materials on you, then absolutely go for it. Okay, so now let's look at the controls and get an idea here. So first thing you can notice is this is using a square gate for the arcade stick. Now there are different gates you could get. For example, you could change this out for an octagonal gate or a circular gate. But honestly, I think when it comes to all around gaming, I think a square gate is probably gonna be your best bet. This is gonna give you really good cardinal directions and you can hit those diagonals pretty easily as well. The 8-bit dough stick also uses a square gate. I think it's a great choice. Now let's have a look at these plungers or buttons next. Now luckily these are really well organized and easy to take apart. You just have to pull out their connectors and it doesn't matter which order they're in. And then you just need to push on the two tabs on each side and then pop them out. It's a little bit tight for my fingers so I used a screwdriver instead, but yeah, this is what the plungers look like. And like I mentioned, they have a good amount of travel for an arcade button. And again, I actually think that's a good thing when you want an all around arcade stick. We're not talking about just fighting games here, we're talking about everything. To give you a comparison, Comparison, here is the one from the 8-bit dough arcade stick. You can see it has much less travel and it taps down much more easily. Now this has the exact same control setup, so if you wanted, you could use buttons like this. And yes, if you want to have really quick action movements, then that's going to be a better choice. But again, I think when it comes to all around gaming, I think having more travel is better, especially if it's going to be like kids who want to beat down on the buttons and things like that, that's going to be really good. Either way, it's super awesome that they use standardized buttons, so you can swap them out if you'd like. And these are actually identical buttons to another device that I reviewed here on this channel called the Pow Kitty A13. This is a clamshell styled arcade box. And as you can see here, this is a button from it and they're the exact same thing. And it's funny because when I first reviewed the A13, I wasn't a huge fan of these buttons, but over time I've actually come to appreciate how diverse they are. In fact, I've got a few extras of those buttons from last year. And so I'm actually gonna add some here because I think a little bit of an accent of blue colors is gonna look really nice on this stick. Personally, I don't like how it's all red. And so what I'm gonna do here for my fourth column buttons, I'm gonna swap them out for the blue ones instead. 
And if you want to do something similar to this, I'll leave links in the video description to a place where you can buy these buttons as well. And the cool thing is these are very cheap. You can usually get them for maybe a couple bucks each. And so from a performance standpoint, I'm not making any changes here at all. It's just going to look a little bit nicer with that blue to complement the red. And yeah, I think this looks great. So we're going to use this for the rest of the video. Anyway, to close it back up, you just put the two pieces back together, screw all the screws in, and then add your rubber feet. Okay, we're good as new again. So yeah, I think you could mod this thing up, you know, put a new arcade stick in there, change out the gate, or change out the buttons, but honestly, it's good enough as it is. All right, now let's do a little bit of show and tell. We're going to start with the 8-bit dough arcade stick, as you can see on the left. Now, it does have the same button layout, but you may notice that I have swapped out all of my buttons. I did a whole video about this earlier. And like I mentioned, these are much easier to press down on. It's more like a fighting stick than a general purpose arcade stick. And like I said, these both have square gates. Now, the 8-bit dough stick has a bunch of knobs and things like that. You can switch it between the Switch and Xbox mode, or you can change it from left stick to D-pad to right stick. And you can also set up turbo buttons and macros as well as a home button. So in that sense, in terms of the functions, this is actually almost the exact same as the one from Ken Hank. But there are a couple things that are better about this. For example, this has wireless connectivity. It has a 2.4 gigahertz USB dongle and can also connect via Bluetooth. On top of that, you can also use it with a wired connection. It also has a battery inside that lasts a really long time. I've probably only charged it like three times in the past year. So definitely the 8-bit dough stick has some clear advantages here. It can be wireless and has a battery. But honestly, other than those two functions, that's about it. And these each cost about a hundred bucks. Sometimes you can find the 8-bit dough one for cheaper, but yeah, it's about the same price. And they're both about the same thickness, but one of the other things I like about it is the Super Console one is actually more comfortable to use because it's rounded at the top. I always felt like after a while, the 8-bit dough arcade stick was digging into my wrists. I did not have that problem with the Super Console one. Anyway, other than that, very similar experiences. I will say the 8-bit dough one is much heavier. This is 2.1 kilograms compared to less than a kilogram and a half for the Super Console arcade stick. Now, the other arcade thing I can show off is that Pal Kitty A13 that I mentioned earlier. This is a clamshell device that also can run arcade just right there on it. So it's kind of like a bar top arcade that can collapse down. And they have some pretty neat features with this one. For example, the arcade stick is inside the device itself, and then you would screw it in when you're ready to play. And this one is also about $100, but I gotta say, in terms of looks and quality, there's no comparison between the other two and this one here. This one feels like a child's toy. And I'm saying that after I've gone and changed out the arcade stick and the buttons, and also added weights to the bottom to give it more heft. On top of that, I actually installed Botacera custom firmware on this as well. And so yeah, in terms of just sheer amount of work and love and care that I've put into these three sticks, the Palkity A13 has definitely gotten most of the love. But I gotta be honest, after that initial novelty of using it, it kind of wore off pretty fast. So again, if I had to rank these devices that are all about $100 each, I would put the A13 at the very bottom. It does have some promise and potential to it. For example, I think it's got a nice big screen, and I like the fact that it does have HDMI out as well. But I think in terms of power, performance, and overall quality, it just can't compare to the Super Console Arcade Stick. Okay, so that's a deep dive in just kind of the feel and the quality of the stick. Let's get back to some of those functions again. We're going to go back to the studio this time and do a couple more tests. First and foremost, I do want to confirm here, it does have Wi-Fi, but it doesn't have Bluetooth. So you are going to be able to connect it to your home network and then go into the updates and downloads section and then download new themes for it. And there are quite a lot of themes that are available for Emulec, and so I'll show my three favorite right here. And so I recommend if you are going to use this Emulec setup to change out that theme from the default one. I think these other ones just look really nice and it kind of upgrades that whole experience. Okay, the other thing I wanted to test was external controller support. And like I mentioned, this doesn't have Bluetooth. So even though the menu does say that you can pair a controller, if you actually try to do it, it's not going to pick it up at all, no matter what game mode you're using. But it supports a wired connection right out of the box. Now for the 8-bit dough controller, I have it on the D setting. This is the Android slash D input setting according to their manual. And this one works just fine. It picked up on the controller, no problem. I mapped everything and we're good to go. And so if you wanted to play a two-player arcade where one person uses a stick and the other person uses a controller, you're going to have to use a wired controller, but other than that, it's just fine. One other benefit here is that it'll actually charge the controller at the same time, too. Now, I tried a bunch of different controllers. For example, I tried the 8-bit dough Xbox controller. This is supposed to work with both the Xbox and PC games. But as you can see here, Emiolek did not pick up on it at all, so this controller didn't work. 
But another one I tried is this B-Top controller. This is one of my favorites to use with both Emulek and Botticera, just because it seems to work with everything. And yeah, this one works great. I was able to connect to the controller immediately and then map all my buttons and we're good to go again. So if you don't want to spend the $50 to get an 8-bit Doe controller, this $20 one will work fine. Now next I wanted to see if I could do more than two players. Now there's only one other USB input on the box itself and it's a USB-C input. And again, that's a connection you would use if you're going to use this as a controller, as we'll do here in a minute. Now, unfortunately, when using Emulek, that USB-C input doesn't work at all. So even if you plug in a controller, it's not going to detect it. And so my guess here is if you want to have more than two players on the Emulek side, you're going to have to get a USB-A hub. And so that's going to be one of those things that'll plug into the one USB port and then give you additional ones there. Unfortunately, I didn't have one here to test with here in my testing, but that's how Emulek works for four player gameplay. So I'm pretty confident that's how it's going to go. So now let's actually talk about using this thing as an external arcade stick. We'll start by plugging it into a Nintendo Switch and getting that to work. Now according to the manual, all you have to do is just plug it in and it's going to work perfectly. But as you can see here, it was not registering my buttons at all. Now digging a little bit more into the instructions, it did say there were some times where you need to hold the mode button and that might switch it over to what you need. In fact, there are little lights here on the left to show like an X input or an Android input. But unfortunately when it came to Nintendo Switch, none of these worked. I tried to hold down the mode button, it didn't work. But I did find if I held down the mode button and then the home button it would switch to Android mode and so you'll see a little light here by the letter A but unfortunately that doesn't work with the Nintendo Switch either so if you just follow the instructions you're probably gonna get stuck here now luckily I did figure it out but it was right before finishing the final cut of this video so I'm gonna go over to our kids gaming setup here and you're just gonna have to forgive the clutter anyway what you have to do is hold down the mode button for about three or four seconds and then you hold down the X button for a couple seconds too after you do that you're gonna want to press the home button either on the switch or the ps4 and then it'll work just fine now unfortunately there's nothing in the manual that says to do that but just by sheer luck I was able to figure it out so yes, you can play this on the PS4 and it works on the Nintendo Switch as well. The instruction manual says that it also works with the PS3, but again, I didn't have one to test with, but I'm pretty confident it will if it worked for the PS4 and the Switch in this regard. So yeah, I'm a happy camper that it works at all. It just was a pain in the butt because it took me like three days to figure this out. Okay, moving forward, let's test it out with PC gaming. Now this one was actually plug and play, no problems here. All I had to do was just plug it in and it detected it automatically. And so if you're gonna wanna play arcade games on a Windows-based machine, or you wanna plug this into your Steam Deck or Botticera, all of those should work just fine. So yeah, I think in terms of just using this as a standalone arcade stick, this is basically the exact same as the 8-bit Doe one. It just doesn't have a battery or wireless connection. Okay, so this is a much longer review video than my usual one, so let's start wrapping up. Let's talk about what I like and what I don't like about the Super Console Arcade Stick. We'll start with what I like. Number one, the build quality is outstanding. This is actually much better than your typical Chinese console by far. The amount of quality we're getting for this price is actually very competitive and super surprising. And I like the fact that this thing is an all-in-one. Not only can you use it for retro game emulation, but you can also just use it as your everyday stick as well. And so I really appreciate the fact that it can also work on the PC, PS4, and the Nintendo Switch. As we saw from my very quick teardown, this is easily modded. If you wanted to change out the gate or the buttons, super easy. And finally, this is kind of weird, but I actually appreciate that there are varying degrees of shadiness when buying this console. Obviously, buying something preloaded with a bunch of copyrighted content is super shady. And so I really appreciate the fact that they actually offer this at a lower price without the card at all. That means you can just buy it as it is and save a little bit of money and then use your own tools and open source firmware to get the same experience, if not a little bit better. And so now let's talk about what I don't like about this machine. Number one is that SD card, man. It is a mess in terms of organization and configurations. They try to sell this thing as if it's just a plug and play experience that you can plug it in, you can play every single game at your fingertips. And for people who just want to plug and play, yeah, they're probably going to really be attracted to that idea. But mark my words, if you do go that route, you're probably going to be frustrated with the experience. Not only that, the SD card that they use is super generic and very prone to failure. So six months from now, that card's going to crap out on you anyway. Anyway, just another argument for why I think it's better to bring your own card. As we also saw, the instruction manual is actually poorly written. And so for that reason, I think if you only use the manual, you'll probably get lost if you try to hook it up to PS4 or Switch. I've been reviewing these things for two years now, and it still took me several days to figure it out myself. The next two are kind of nitpicks, but I wish that there were more USB-A ports on the back. It'd be great to be able to just plug in three other controllers and have four-player gameplay just like that. As it stands right now, it's great for two-player gameplay, but you're going to need a hub for more than that. 
And finally, it would have been nice to have Bluetooth as well, because then you wouldn't even need those USB-A ports, you could just hook up the controllers via Bluetooth. But unfortunately, that's a limitation of the chip that they're using in this machine. And so at the end of the day, I'd rather keep the cost down by using a cheap chip than trying to pay more for a function that many people may not want. And so yeah, at the end of the day, that's what I like and what I don't like about the Super Console Arcade Stick. And so typically here, I usually talk about whether or not I think it's going to be worth your money. And it's been a while, but I think that I can unequivocally say, yes, this thing is well worth about $100, $115, depending on where you get it. For that price, you're getting a solid arcade stick. In fact, to get an arcade stick of similar quality and functions, it's going to be around $100 anyway. But on top of that, you have a pretty robust budget chip that usually in a Super Console X will cost something like $40 or $50. And so with these two powers combined for $100, $115, I think that's a great deal. Just in the week that I've been testing it, it's become my family's like favorite thing to play on. We have all these handhelds and everything else at home, but the kids keep asking to play this thing instead. And I think that says a lot in terms of just having a nice, fun little family machine for everyone to use. Anyway, let me know what you think in the comments below. Is this something worth considering or do you think there's better options out there? And be on the lookout for my next video where I actually show you how to set all this up yourself to save a little bit of money on the way. As always, thank you for watching and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.